Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending. We really appreciate you being here. And um, yeah, uh, my name is Dave. Um, my colleague Michael is uh, joining me as well. We both work with the NOC team. And this presentation is all about the technical suboptimalities that we have noticed on the platform. So they could either be uh, encountered during customer cases, or that could be uh, gathered by the statistics that we also gather on the pairing platform. So walking you through the topics of the day, um, Michael is going to kick it off with the S-flow and statistics. Then we're going on to the route servers and some other topics, such as the packet loss um, latency troubleshooting. Uh, that also includes uh, reordering troubleshooting that sometimes uh, occurs. Um, then we're going to move on to allowed, but also unallowed traffic that is still there. Go, uh, going over to the tech -out guidelines, because we try to uphold the code of conduct, of course. Uh, we will like to remind you of the uh, self-service possibilities, go over the publicly available resources, and of course, the questions and suggestions. Michael, it's over to you. Hi. Can you hear me? OK. Hi. Uh, so we will start from a relatively uh, simple topic, the S-flow and the statistics. So before we start, we want to draw your attention something uh, about uh, the capabilities of the S-flow cap uh, uh, software in ARM6. So basically, we just uh, check out the layer 2 header. So we need the process of no store flow information from higher protocols, because sometimes we get a couple of questions from the, our customers whether we can support something like to check on the IP layers above or not. So but as appearing uh, as a layer 2 uh, uh, platform, we don't check this so far. Well, first thing first, this is our uh, total traffic statistics. Well, this is available on our website where well, you can check the live statistics from our website. So, well, to how, to use it, how to use this kind of uh, 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 services? Uh, well, sometimes if you notice a very big dip on the graph, probably there's an indication that we have some incidents, uh, but sometimes it's maybe the S-Flow software has some issues. So, if you notice such a dip in the, traffic, in the traffic flow graph, then it's up to you to decide whether you decide to quickly shift away the traffic from your traffic from ARM6 link or not. And uh, the second is uh, the S-flow uh, for each member. If you, for each member of Zero login, you can check out the statistics for inbound and outbound on your link. You can select the top two customers, top five customers. Well, this is the statistics of the ARM6, uh, 1200. Well, to be honest, it's a pity that we see so limited traffic over here, so no too many guys are checking our website and using our automation features. So, well, this can be a couple of scenarios that you can use these features. The first one is something like, from time to time, we have the questions from customers. They notice a very sharp decrease on their traffic, uh, on, on, uh, very sharp decrease of the traffic on their link. Well, with this uh, as flow, you can select the top for instance, top 10 uh, customers, if you, you can find it out easily that uh, which customers has uh, decreased the traffic on the ARM6 link or not, then probably it's due to the change on their routing policy. Then you can directly contact uh, the customers and uh, ask them why they shift away the traffic from ARM6 link. Well, the second scenario that this, fe uh, this software, uh, these features can be useful, it sounds like it's a place that you can validate the BGP community is uh, correctly implemented by our route server or not. So, for instance, if you want to advertise, if you don't want to advertise some of the subnets to a specific, pref uh, specific peers, besides checking on the looking glass, you can also go directly to here. If everything is implemented correctly on the route server, you shouldn't be able to notice over here that the other peer is sending the traffic to you. Well, well, also we have the broadcast and the multicast traffic. So it is indicated all of the uh, live statistics and also monthly statistics of the broadcast traffic, uh, ARB traffic in the network. So over here is also uh, a good indica indication that whether we have experienced some incident in the network or not. And also here is a good indication that for the customers to configure some of the features on their side. For instance, if you can check out uh, uh, the normal uh, amount of traffic for the bomb traffic. You can configure something like you can control plane protection features correctly. And head over to Dave. Yes, and with that, we're going to talk about the route servers. And of course, we're briefly going to uh, review why you would use them. Then we're going over to the statistics, some suboptimalities that we've seen in the current operations. And lastly, we're going to optimize your search in M6's looking glass. 
So going over why you would use them. Imagine if you're a new or even an existing customer that doesn't peer with the route server. That means that you have to initialize uh, or initiate, uh, also have to administer, and you have to maintain all those separate BGP peering sessions with all the connected parties. And with 90% of the peering platform actually peering uh, with the route servers, that means that you would actually peer with 90% of the customers with only maintaining two BGP sessions with the route servers. Um, you can also choose to um, manage your most important peers and uh, let us do the rest, uh, but um, you are absolutely certain that when you uh, peer with the route servers, you will uh, send from day one, but even more importantly, you will also receive everything from day one, and that is close to 300k prefixes, maybe 280, but we'll get back to that in the next slide. Um, the most important factor um, for filtering nowadays is uh, maintaining the pairing policy, and MZIX provides you options to, um, to um, define your filtering needs, so you can either choose to uh, filter based on IRDB, filter on uh, RPKI only, uh, or you can actually do both. And that is the default option when you enable pairing with the M6 route service. Um, that is an easy option that you can, um, that you can um, identify on your, um, your M6 interface on my M6.net. Now, before we uh, go over to the suboptimalities, so let's briefly look at the statistics. And what's interesting here, and for those with keen eyes, you can see that we have, of course, a lot of peering uh, totals. Uh, but what's more interesting here is actually the, um, the discrepancy between route server one and route server two in terms of established sessions. There, um, while it's not much, it's actually four sessions for any party that could be connected to the uh, platform. Um, who maybe only has an, um, an established session with Route Server 1, Route Server 2, um, but preferably we would um, have both Route Servers to be established, uh, to have established sessions with you. You can also see that with the prefixes sent, there's a discre uh, discrepancy, and uh, for that reason we recommend you, for resilience purposes, to um, check your sessions with the Route Servers. Going over to the second pane of statistics, uh, and specifically going over filtering, um, looking at the first line with not properly published um, prefixes in IRDB, um, that actually includes percentages of best primary prefixes. Um, and I'm saying primary because we have the, um, the most uh, important prefixes, we only um, provide you with the most interesting ones in terms of BGP. So going over not properly published uh, prefixes in IRDB, that's, that's a surprising 38% for IPv4 and 50% for IPv6. Now, comparing that to the table below that, imagine if you're a customer and you're filtering only on IRDB or um, both IRDB and RPKI. That is more than 90% if you combine the both of them, and that means that there is a chance that you may not actually reach all the prefixes because there are some suboptimalities <coughs> with someone's IRDB's policies. We're going over to um, IRDB policies in a bit, but first, let's go over to the total overview. Um, the first one that I'm going through is BGP communities, which are not stripped. We can identify so on the route service themselves, but we can also identify that on the looking glass, and more importantly, you can also do that yourself on the looking glass. I'm going to show you how to do that on the looking glass in just a moment, but let's go through these sections first. Secondly, I'm going over import and export statements, which are missing. I'm going to provide an example uh, use case and what you can do to resolve such a case. I'm going over RPKI invalis, uh, which could be caused by incorrect ROAS. Going over unallowed prefixes and over large communities, over extended communities. Headed over to the first one with a snippet on the right. A snippet on the right is from our looking glass, and this is not a random prefix, it's a prefix which we identified to actually have a lot of communities in gray, not the blue ones, I'll go over that later, but it's specifically the gray ones. And what we see there, and touching on the first, po um, first point on the next slide, um, um, uh, let me briefly touch back on uh, communities, uh, communities as a whole first. So the reason why we use communities is uh, for fast configurations, right? It's easy, 
Um, but on the other hand, it's also not scalable because if you have to maintain all those separate communities on your, on your border routers that perform all the pairings, it's going to be quite a hassle. And on top of that, um, it forces more load on our route service because we have to parse every single community. We must search for a match. And thirdly, you also won't be able to control inbound policies, or at least not that easy, um, in contrary to filtering based on uh, actual policies like IRDB. We have the same snippet here on the right, and uh, with that, I'm going to touch on that, uh, with the first point being, please do not use private communities. An example would be including 65,000 to zero, and uh, so on. So please review your prefixes that you um, have in the looking glass that you're uh, sending to us, and please review that uh, to make sure that you're not actually using private communities. The second uh, thing that I want to touch on is do not propagate communities that were picked up early in the path that don't actually need to be there. Um, I've blurred out the AS path, Maybe someone with very good glasses could actually read the ASs, uh, but I can assure you that the AS is listed in the communities. Some of them don't, don't actually, um, are not included in the AS path. I'm going over to the import and export um, missing case. So imagine that you do not have import via or export via attributes uh, configured in the outnum object uh, for your autonomous system. And with the outnum object, I refer to your registry. In this case, let's refer to write. Uh, the example holds that you advertise customer prefixes and uh, your own prefixes to the route server. And the customer prefixes originate from other autonomous systems. Uh, the result of that is that your prefixes are validated because they originate from your autonomous system. So logically, everything seems well, right? But what about those customers? The customers' prefixes will be invalidated um, because um, uh, they match, um, the advertised prefix matches your, um, your autonomous system number, but it should actually match the customer's uh, ASN. Uh, the solution to this would be to uh, go over to your, um, in this case, right portal, go to the, uh, go to the dashboard and actually create a um, RPSL policy, which stands for Routing Policy Specification Language, but let's call it RPSL for easy purpose. Um, and then you would add import, and preferably import via, and export uh, attributes explicitly describing your intentions uh, for your filtering needs. Um, what we often see is that customers, um, let me say members, um, uh, that they refer to um, uh, in a policy, an IRDB policy, they uh, include their own ASN and they also refer to the customer's ASNs. Keep it plain and simple. We don't need any of that difficult stuff. Uh, a final note on this one is that the import via and the export via are actually intended for multilateral pairings, so specifically defined for uh, internet exchanges. Um, and that also means that we have actually taken precedence for those for, um, for any of the uh, objects that are um, mentioned in your policies. So, the one, those take precedence on the route servers. Um, going over some examples, but please know that these examples um, are also found on our website, just like a lot of the information I'm going through right now. Um, on the website, we have um, so many more um, examples that you can use. Um, but imagine that you want a plain and simple, um, plain and simple import and plain and simple export. What you could do is actually go for the any option. Of course, include your own ASN. Don't include our administrative line, please. Um, and you would be ready for importing and exporting if you were to actually have uh, AS666. If you actually want to um, uh, not import or export towards them, uh, you, could, um, you could use the any accept option. There's also the restrictive option, logically, if you actually want to be very restrictive about who you import and who you export to. Note that in the middle uh, example, you can also use route objects. I'm going over to the route objects in a bit, uh, but first let me touch on the source of RPK invalids. Uh, in the next slide, I'm going to show row creation, and row creation is necessary for origin validation. And it's an ongoing topic in terms of routing security. Routing security is a one-on-one -on -one with manners, and manners, as you can see, it's very long, it's a mouthful. It's mutually agreed norms for routing security, but let's call it manners for this purpose. Manners basically underline a set of actions and they provide, uh, they provide guidance um, in terms of routing security, and they focus on three pillars. 
I'm going to touch on the first one uh, today with, um, with invalids, uh, because it's incorrect routing information. Um, but please also take note for the second one, uh, and the third one, of course. Um, I, have a, uh, I have two snippets from the um, RIPE dashboard included in this slide, and um, I have one prefix here, um, and I also have a, um, a row created. And as you can see, the row that I've created actually has a one behind it, meaning that it actually corresponds with the, uh, with the announcement that we're making. And when creating these rows, there are three things listed here that you should take into account. That, um, that your ROA must actually match the autonomous system. It uh, also must match on the prefix that you are advertising, and it must have a correct maximum length set, and please do not exceed the length. Now, RIPE also has a very cool function in their, uh, in their, uh, on their website. They can actually suggest ROAs for you. Uh, so we don't have, even have to think about it. We can see what their suggestions are based on the actual data that they have, Note that it could be incomplete. Uh, so always review before you actually enable it. Now, um, while this subject is something, um, especially for other continental networks, I do still want to touch upon this subject uh, because it's very important, of course. Uh, we very much discourage advertising BOGON prefixes, default routes, RFC 1918. Um, did I miss any? Uh, Martian addresses and many more that are listed here. Thank you, Team Kimru, for providing the list, the same list that we also use on the route servers. Um, and please also know that it's not allowed to advertise from one pairing address with another pairing address as the next help. Um, going for a two-slider on extended communities. Extended communities are supposed to solve the problem that we have with 16-bit ASNs. And um, actually, they're doing more harm than we bargained for. So there are three things listed here. Uh, I'm going through them. And one of them is that signaling between two networks um, with 32-bit ASNs, they do, not, uh, they do not cooperate. And the second issue is with the administrator or the assigned number part is that it has variable lengths. And the third one is actually the one for the next slide is the uh, famous AS0 Juniper issue, uh, which I'll um, show in a moment. But please know that AMZIX is planning to decommission extended communities per 2023, or in 2023. We will, of course, inform you via TECO. I'm also going to touch on TECO in a moment. But uh, before we do that, um, yeah, let's, um, let's mention that BGP large communities actually resolve the problems that are listed here. The AS0 problem is um, becoming quite a uh, familiar problem uh, with us, but also with other ISP colleagues. Um, and uh, while, the standard, while it's quite standard with EuroIX, it's standardized, um, um, actually Juniper has a issue with uh, supporting zero in the administrator part and that is the uh, one of the reasons why we actually want to move to large communities because issues that were previously listed are simply addressed by large communities. We implemented large communities and they're free to use. Um, you can see how to use them on our website. Just like all of the other info that we have just like these with the route objects. Now, if you're looking to automate filtering, you can quickly do a uh, who is on route objects. And uh, looking for some of the route objects here, I'm not going to mention them all, but uh, it basically uh, provides you an entire list which is continuously updated with an entire overview of peers, connected ASNs for both IPv4 and IPv6. And that really makes pairing so much easier. Now, for simplicity's sake, I've also included our own AS1200. Uh, this is simple who is uh, public information. Uh, this is our very own uh, policy, and it doesn't need to be lengthy. And the reason why I'm showing this is because it's actually super easy. Uh, you could actually copy this, of course, adjust the ASN number, and not 1200, please. And uh, you can actually use this to import and export um, in a very, very nice and, yeah, nice and tidy manner. Um, note that on the first export rule, we actually use one of the route objects because it's really nice and tidy. So we don't need an entire list uh, when grabbing for who is information. Um, I'm going over to the looking glass. Uh, with on the left-hand side, we have two route servers. They have IBGP sessions with the route collector. 
and the rug collector in turn, uh, in turn runs Birdwatcher API. And Birdwatcher API provides the looking glass with all the info that we need so we can look for our prefixes and see what the latest status on it is. Um, so um, this project, when the rug collector was uh, implemented, it was actually twofold. One of them was so that internal applications wouldn't directly contact the route servers, and the other reason was, of course, so that we could provide a public user interface, uh, namely Alice. So when looking at Alice, or lg.amzix.net, as it shows on the top, um, I want to touch on a couple of things that you need to take into account when looking for your prefixes. So please note that when you're searching for prefixes, we only show the best primary importer prefixes. If it's not there, make sure that you do some, uh, some configuration checks. And if, if there's ever any issue, you're, you're always free to contact us to look into your, uh, your prefix matter. So um, you can, of course, use the looking glass to identify routing policy issues. Um, the route servers do not modify the BGP next hope. And the route server's local AS number is also not prepended to the AS path. With the um, snippet on the left of um, the prefix that was mentioned earlier with the ROAS, I'm also taking the same prefix, and we see a couple of communities listed in blue over here. And these communities, they align with the table on the right. The table on the right is also information that you can find on our website. The blue ones are set by the route server themselves, so you cannot influence them. But it's a very nice method of actually identifying what the current status is of your prefix. We can see that the prefix is learned at route server one, the prefix has a valid row of status, and the prefix is present in the announced AS set. Of course, if there is ever an issue with, um, with any other pairing party that you're experiencing, we want you to know that there is a tool on our website that you can use to contact that partner directly. Because in most cases, we are a layer two platform, and we do not handle your prefixes directly. If there is ever an issue, know that you can actually contact them. So with a nice snippet on the right of some cool statistics, uh, you can actually go to our website and search for pairing IP addresses, organization names, autonomous systems, VLANs. So VLANs could be the ISP VLAN, which is the largest one that we have. But there's also other ones like the IPX or GRX and such. And with that, going back to Michael. So going back to our discussion uh, this morning, so uh, we have already gone through the topics like uh, for S-flow statistics and uh, the, the route server, the looking glass, and we'll continue with the packet loss and uh, packet reordering re and highlight issues. Uh, because we sometimes get a lot of complaints, uh, say something like uh, when the traffic is going through the ARM6 network, they have a packet loss issues. And uh, this is kind of troubleshooting, is kind of very time consuming, and also the customers getting quite impatient. So that's why we decided we are going to, to, to the summarize what is the basic facilities we have, what is the tools we are using, and what is the basic troubleshooting procedure for us to troubleshoot these kind of scenarios. So typically we have uh, the, what we call ARM6 monitor box connected to each of the provider edge switch. So basically just a Linux server which has a 10G uh, uh, interface connecting directly to the prov provider, provider edge switch. Uh, so on top of that, we're running something like R pin, pin, trace route, and some, 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 some proprietary ARM6 tools on top of that. And we also typically have the iperf uh, running on top of that. So for the typical, uh, typical uh, troubleshooting procedure, well, the first step we are going to do the troubleshooting is going to, we are going to swap the customer connections from the primary pass to the secondary pass. So we typically have the PXE. So the, for the customer edge switch is directly connected to the PXE, it is a photon, photonix uh, layer one switch. And from the PXE switch, we have the, a pair of P pro provider edge switch collecting over there. So we have the primary pass and we have the secondary pass. So what do we typically do? We are going to swap the link from the primary switch to the secondary switch to validate if the issue is still persist, uh, is the issue, we, we still have the issues over there. Suppose, suppose the issue is still there, very likely the problem is on the customer side. But uh, in some cases, for instance, we, we are suspicious that we have some issues on the core side. We are going to continue with the troubleshooting. So we are going to 
In this case, we are going to ask the, a bit more information for the characteristics of the flows for the, for the customer traffic they think they have the issues. We ask them to provide with our destination address. So with the destination address, we are going to, we are, we, we, we are, we are able, be able to know the end-to-end -end path. So we are going to, spec we can specify from which PE switch to which PE switch we have the issues. And then we are going to run the test from the two directed monitor boxes from over there. We are going to play around with the parameters a, a, a little bit. We are going to generate something like, we are going to run iProof servers from the different ports, and we are going to run the iProof client in parallel. So the target is something like we can generate the sufficient traffic, so it is going to distribute it to all of the backbone links. And we can also manipulate something like LSP paths. So for, for, for we have something like two cores, we can, we can, we can manipulate the traffic is going, going Cross one core or going through the going through the other cores. So suppose we don't have these kinds of issues, then very likely the issue is not on ARM6 side. But sometimes the customer still insists that we still going to proceed with troubleshooting. So in this kind of scenario, we are going to say we are going to kind of request the customers to connect their test devices as close as possible to ARM6. So most ideally, they have the customer test server directly connected to their cloud. Uh, uh, directly connect to their CE routers over there. So for the most typically, uh, the, the, the packet loss issues, I think it is related to the, the backbone links for the line card, which is black hole in the traffics. So we have a couple of solutions. We have, of course, a traditional NMS to, 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 to track whether the line card is working properly, but sometimes the line card itself is not functioning properly. It's black holding the traffic, it's discarding the packets, so it cannot, we cannot rely on them to report normally to the MS. And we also have the, 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 the OAM, so the need node which we use to, to track the, the jitter, jitter, the latencies. But for, typically for this kind of traffic, for this kind of devices, it's only unique source IP, unique source address, uh, source port and destination address and destination port. So typically, this is going to be the traffic for, for this kind of device is going to pass through only one piece, uh, backbone link. So in order to more proactively monitor all of the backbone links in ARM6, we have developed a kind of property tool, property tool uh, what we call the BB entropy. So the, the idea is quite straightforward. It is going to run on two of the monitor boxes. So we are going to run the TCP request from one, po from, from one of the hosts. It's going to start from a lot of TCP source ports. So we are going to guarantee that this kind of traffic will be distributed to all of the backbone links. And upon the receiving of this kind of traffic, the, 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 the software on the other side is going to just send a TCP disconnection. So by monitoring this kind of statistics, how many we have generated and how many we have received, we are going to actually monitor whether all of the backbone links are functioning properly or not. And uh, the next one is about the allowed traffic. So actually, we are running VPS network. It is the emulated uh, layer two network. So in principle, it is inherited all of the design limitations from the layer two network. So we have the broadcast. Uh, and uh, uh, this kind of layer two network have something like a lot of limitations. Actually, we have quite a lot of, uh, we have extensive documentation explaining what kind of a lot of traffic uh, from the customer port. But the reality is that we see, still see quite a lot of unallowed traffic. And this kind of uh, unallowed traffic is causing the stability issues uh, for not only for the ARM6 platform, but also for the other members connecting to, to the ARM6 platform. Well, there was once we received a huge amount of traffic from an illegal MAC address. So the traffic is so huge that uh, uh, for the line card, is going to a lot of overhead for the line card. So eventually, the line card crashed. Of course, this is a bug of the vendor. So uh, it is a bug of the vendor. We, but more importantly, more importantly, this kind of traffic shouldn't be necessary to be sent to the ARM6 port. And we have another example, is something like there was once another customer who sent the unnecessary air app request to the network. Well, before our, our app sponge kicks in, so it caused the, 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 the reboot of the other member router. So we have categorized the most typical violation of the traffic for the LDP, CDP traffic. So this link local traffic shouldn't be necessary in our network. And we have the BGP traffic to disconnect uh, 
the dis to, to disconnected members, and we have traffic from the illegal source of MAC addresses and IPv6 multicast traffic. For we, during the process, we, we are doing this kind of ticket with our customers. We summarize the most typical scenarios of the violations. The, one of them is a topology change. For instance, previously, the customer router is directly connected to our switch. And later on, they change the topology, the hook up a switch between their router and our switch. So in this kind of scenario, we strongly suggest that you configure a dedicated VLAN. For, this, for the port on the, on the switch port connecting to the customer router and uh, on the switch port facing ARM6 connections. And uh, we have the typical scenario like the bug of the customer router. Uh, for instance, the customer says they already disabled the LDP from the interface, but uh, they still send out the LDP traffic. Well, in this case, there's nothing we can do. And uh, we have the loops within the customer own network, and uh, we have the default settings on the equipment. So how ARM6 is to going to mitigate uh, the, this kind of unallowed traffic? Of course, we have layer 2 ACL. So basically, it's just to permit the traffic from one unique MAC address. We have the ingress BOM suppression. So when the BOM traffic from the customer interface is above a certain threshold, we will just drop the packets. And we have ARP sponge. Well, there's uh, extensive documentation on our website to explain what ARP, what ARP sponge is. So basically, it's just uh, listen to the ARP request in the whole network. Suppose uh, the ARP request for a specific IP address is above a, a certain threshold, there's a one host which is, going to up, which is going to answer this ARP request on behalf. So it's going, to, it's, going to, it's going to make sure that the ARP request stops in the network. And more importantly, we have the scripts to detect the unallowed traffic. Basically, we will just run the TCP dump and we check the headers, what kind of traffic it is. So typically, the customer will receive, I'm sure some of your customers have already received this kind of emails. So we have two typical emails generated. So the, the first one is unallowed traffic, and the second one is the, the attempts to establish BGP sessions with disconnected members. So we encourage the customers to, to, to have a look at uh, the, our, the, the email automatically generated because together we are going to build a more resilient network and a better internet community. And, uh, well. and with that, we're continuing with TechL. Uh, we have two more slides to continue. Um, so uh, a couple of things to highlight in terms of TechL. So um, we try to uphold our code of conduct, of course, and. We want all members to um, to be informed of uh, maintenances that they need to be aware of, and also incidents, of course. And we try as much as possible uh, to keep unnecessary emails out of there. And uh, one of the things is, of course, to uh, pay attention to announcements. Um, oftentimes, the information is already there, and we want to request you to please also check with your service desk teams to um, definitely check announcements beforehand. Um, another topic is, of course, subscriptions. We have within the myamzix.net uh, portal, we have uh, several uh, contact roles. And the knock role is uh, one that is by default assigned to uh, actually receive uh, emails from uh, the techo list as well as the technical contact person. So we advise you to review your contact roles and make sure that you're actually listed as a subscriber. Um, imagine during the 6th of April, uh, touching on the second point, um, looking at the 6th of April and taking it as an example, uh, we were receiving a lot of unicast emails uh, asking us for updates um, about an incident that we were actively trying to inform everyone of. And that actually caused um, for a lot of uh, administrative overhead. Um, overhead that we actually needed uh, to also uh, work on the um, remediation of the issue and also the aftermath of 6 uh, April. Um, so we request you to, uh, when, there, uh, when there's such a huge scale incident, that um, we will inform you. And please do not urgently ask for updates because it's um, as much as, as silly as it sounds, um, it was a very large queue. And while we understand your concerns, please know that we're definitely working on that at that point. Uh, the last one is one that Costa's already addressed, um, but yeah, can't address it enough. Um, 
don't do not uh, send auto replies uh, to TechL messages. Uh, the last thing I want to uh, touch upon is the self-service possibilities that you have within the portals. Um, please note that you can change your MAC addresses or even add a temporary second one if you're looking to migrate your equipment or hardware. There is any maintenance ongoing. That's one of the possibilities you can do yourself. Um, but if, of course, for any of these, these topics counts that you can always reach out to us. Um, you can also change your RDNS entry uh, for your MZX assigned interface. Uh, you can request an IPv6 address, which is not done by default. Uh, and you can, most importantly, enable or even disable your BGP peering sessions either with the route servers or with the AS1200 routers, which is our administrative plan. And with that concluded, with that, it is actually um, the end of our presentation, and we would like to thank you for your attention.